Irax, all to us.com. About to go live. Um, thank y'all for joining me, everybody that's um, out there. I appreciate y'all. Um, we on Instagram as well. Um, for my Instagram folks, um, I'm doing basically a, a, a simulcast on um, Instagram as well as um, YouTube. So if you want to see like the full situation, you can definitely join my um, join this stream on YouTube. But yeah, man, I wanted to say what's up to everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Hope everyone is blessed. Um, those of y'all that are watching on YouTube, if you have any issues with the um, audio, please let me know. Um, please just give me a, <laughs> a heads up on the, in the comments and I'll definitely fix the issue, but I'm testing on a new setup as well. So I just wanted to get on and say what's up to everybody and want to talk about a few things today. So, um, you know, let's, let's get into it. Um, What's going on, everybody in the um, chat room on the um, on Instagram? What's going on, KD? Happy Thanksgiving to you. I appreciate you, fam. What's going on to um, Dope Snare? I see you up in the um, in the YouTube. I see you. So yeah, um, man, where do I start? Um, been doing a lot of thinking about a um, couple, like a, a lot of issues related to. Um, tech, uh, especially with respect to um, music tech. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of um, what we've talked about on my YouTube channel, especially revolves around different ways to just really manipulate music with, um, with respect to computers and, um, a, a lot of what we talk about on the channel kind of revolves around these things like um, integrated systems like machine and the MPC. And um, we've talked about a lot of different ways to look at accomplishing essentially the same thing, which is really using the computer as a music production tool. But, you know, I, I've always found some challenges with um, things that are prescribed as a solution for um, music producers and just computer users in general. Um, and I think it's important that we, um, we challenge things that are prescribed as a one size fits all solution, especially with respect to technology, because I think technology is especially an area where there is a lot of one size fits all solutions. And you know, what do I mean by that? Um, I give you an example. So, you know, one of the, the big challenges for me that I think kind of led a lot of us to this common path of these integrated systems is just the fact that, um, the mouse, the, I, I think the mouse is one of those devices that has been prescribed as a one size fits all solution for controlling a computer. And it, it is done so irrespective of our unique physiology. I think that if we break down what the mouse represents, the mouse in on the computer is it, it's it's uh, it's everything really for you because it really reflects or it, it represents your your a physical extremity. I I typically tend to call the mouse kind of like a magnetic finger in the digital space because I think that's what it kind of tries to represent for us when we're using a computer. It's a magnetic finger. So, you know, if you look at a cursor and how it navigates within the digital space, it's a single, you know, pointed object that you have to basically use to navigate within 
the digital world and you have to use that to select things and you have to use it to grab things and you have to use it to move things and you have to use this one digit essentially this one magnetic digit in digital space to do everything and the solution, the, the hardware peripheral solution that we have been kind of universally prescribed is the mouse as the first kind of like human interface that we use. And you know, you, you gotta realize that with these human interfaces, what they're doing is they're sending a whole bunch of um, commands to the computer, essentially. They're sending like a, a stream of commands um, low level commands to the computer to tell the computer where to go, what to grab, what to select, etc. I always felt like the concept of this magnetic finger is just wrong and it creates all kind of issues for me in terms of how my mind relates to the computer. Because, you know, I got two hands, I have two functional hands, I have two arms. And the idea of being limited to use just one finger essentially to do everything that my mind is thinking to do within a digital space creates a disconnect. I believe in, um, in computing we call, we call uh, the mouse, could, the, the mouse could represent what, what is called a abstract layer because it essentially is a, a system that is hiding um, a, a bunch of different functions and a bunch of different, um, different uh, commands that are happening to the computer. That mouse is hiding that. You don't see all the low level like assembly language commands that the a mouse is sending to the computer to tell it to move. So it's an abstract layer because it's basically hiding the use, it's, it's shielding the user from actually seeing all those commands that you would have to send to the computer to make it go to a certain place. Um, I think that ultimately my mind, when I see certain objects within digital space, I wanna grab it, I wanna grab it with both hands. I want to be able to manipulate it using my hands in a way that this magnetic finger does not allow. Um, so th this is something that I've challenged over the years. And I think this is what led a lot of us to get things like the machine. This is what led a lot of folks to get the MPC Renaissance and the, the other MPCs that came out that connected to the computer and the Ableton Push and all these different concepts that help us to be able to implement using both hands when using a computer for music production. Um, I think that we have to continue to challenge this prescribed notion that this computer or and any computer system should be used and manipulated using one unilateral tool. Because if you look at how unique all of us are physiologically, right? Like we all have different like physical attributes. Um, you know, me personally, I happen to have a pretty, a pretty large um, arm span, wingspan, right? I have like, especially for my height, I have a pretty long wingspan and I have pretty large hands actually. So like my hands are probably, you know, my, my hands are larger than my father's. My father's 6'4", you know, he's, um, he's, a, he's a tall guy. Um, so I have a different physio physiology, right? So the idea that one device should cover the digital representation of our physiology has to, that, 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 that just, just has to connect with you and look wrong or, or feel wrong somehow, because it's no way that all of us with all of our different bodies and all our different shapes are supposed to use the same device 
to represent us within the digital domain. So I've been just going over a lot of um, these types of paradigms and challenging it within my own setup. And that actually led me, I've been on this path for a long time. I've, I've used a lot of different peripherals for the computer outside of just the, um, you know, these integrated systems that I was speaking to. We, I've also used a lot of different, um, just regular computer peripherals, you know, like, of course, Apple has their takes on it. Like, um, you know, this magic mouse concept, this never really worked for me well. I always had a problem with this. Eventually, <coughs> excuse me, eventually I found myself going to um, trackballs and, and, and um, I, you know, I use trackpads and other kind of things for a while, but trackballs have kind of been where I've landed. Hold on one second. <coughs> excuse me. But yeah, I, I've landed at trackballs. Wow, wow. <coughs> man, I got a nasty cough right now for whatever reason. Um, it's just a little dry mouth, sorry about that. <laughs> but um, use this um, Kensington Pro, for example, the, um, the Kensington Expert Pro. That particular device kind of served me better to a degree and you know it, it it helped me to at least have a, a little bit of a, of, of a better range of motion because I always found that the like I said the magnetic finger required you to it actually demands a lot from your your physical arm because essentially you you're grabbing or clicking with one hand and you're also moving within a digital space using that same hand that you're grabbing. So that's actually creating a lot of physical demand on one, one hand essentially, because you you know, you click something to hold it or grab it, especially for us audio people where we're doing a lot of drag and drop and stuff. It, you, you know, you click, you, you click, you hold, you drag, and you move it along a digital space. And what, what a standard mouse, you have to do a lot more, you know, motion in order to move it along digital space. Trackball has definitely been better in the sense that it doesn't demand all the extended um, shoulder and potential elbow um, motion, but it's still, it's, it's, it, it's not the end all. It's not the final solution. I don't think it's, I still don't think it's the best solution. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's led me to now um, go into a domain of trying to solve some of the problems I have by actually imp implementing a two device concept. So that's kind of what I've been working on outside of, you know, working on music and audio and stuff. I've been playing around with a two device concept. I'm currently using actually, um, two track balls, one in each hand. So essentially the way here, the way that this concept works for me, and it's, it's, it's all just conceptual. I'm just playing around with different ideas. So, you know, this is part of what I try to do to try to just make the computer workflow and just the music production workflow work better for me. So the way that this, this two handed approach works is that I have a vertical trackball in my right hand. This, my right hand is my dominant hand. Um, I use a horizontal trackball in my left hand. The right hand, my dominant hand, I use for what I would consider to be grabbing and clicking motions. So essentially using the right hand, which is my dominant hand, to click and also to click and hold. So one hand to do that motion. I have been using my left hand to actually do um, navigation. So essentially anytime I need to move to any place digitally with some accuracy, I use the left hand. 
and it, it's using the trackball. So essentially, I'm grabbing with right hand, navigating with the left hand. And I will say that that has actually um, helped me out a lot because I believe that it helps for me to remove some of the abstract layers that are between my brain and the actual computer. Um, essentially, now I can use both hands to move things in digital space using that approach. Um, I won't say it's perfect. Um, I, I don't think anything, I don't think there is a perfect device for everybody on the computer yet, but I, I definitely think that, you know, it's important for us to evaluate our own physiology and start to find solutions that are actually comfortable for who we are as individuals. I, I, I don't think that the one size fits all approach for music production and music or in technology in general. I don't, I don't think that one size fits all will ever be the right thing because the reality is I, I think with technology, unless you are part of developing said technology and you are building it to your own specific personal spec, you can almost assume that the technology was not built for you. I'm gonna say that again. You can, you can assume that if you were not a part of the actual development and specification of a specific technology, in most cases, you can assume that it was not built specifically for you. It was built with someone else in mind. It was tested most likely on someone else that wasn't you, that does not have the same physiology as you. It was tested on people that may have a different workflow and different requirements than you. So it's important that you don't assume that just because a technology exists, that it has been made or developed for you. Because this, this is where a lot of us kind of go wrong and start to get frustrated because we think that because a technology exists and that it has um, been proven for someone else that it unilaterally works for everybody. And therefore, uh, if you don't have said technology, that something is wrong with you or you are not doing things correctly because everybody else has said technology. I think this is the wrong concept for, for tech in general. Um, a good example of that, I would say is, um, actually, uh, if you look at how a lot of the automated uh, restroom technology works, um, automatic, there's, there's been some studies and I, I can pull this up actually. Um, there's been some studies around this. Um, what am I looking at right here? Um, now this article actually is talking about racial bigotry or racial bias. It's called, um, bigotry encoded racial bias in technology. Now we talked about this before, um, but essentially what has been happening is that these automatic soap dispensers that, you know, and automatic um, faucets for that matter as well, they have a bias towards a specific pigment of people because the way that they work is based off of infrared technology. So I'll, I'll read a snippet of this, and this is from um, reporter.rit.edu. So I'll just read a, a, a section of it so you understand what I'm saying here. Um, it says, and the, the quotation, uh, it, it says, is this, soap, is this soap dispenser racist? Was the question that became an internet sensation in a video at Marriott Hotel, an automatic soap dispenser is shown unable to detect a black customer's hand. The dispenser used near infrared technology to detect hand motions, an article on Mike read. 
The invisible light is reflected back from the skin, which triggers the sensor. Darker skin tones absorb more light. Thus, thus enough light isn't reflected back to the sensor to activate the soap dispenser, which means that dark skinned restroom users will have to skip washing their hands with this not so sensitive soap dispenser. And it goes on, but that's just a, that's just a part of the conversation. And clearly, you know, it's, it's a bias that was built into a certain technology that, you know, that didn't need bias. It didn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily need that bias. And I, I, I don't, I won't even say that that bias was intentional, but most likely the group of people that it was tested on had the same pigment. And therefore the testing proved that the, the technology worked, but they didn't test it on everybody to see if there was a abnormal failure rate with other pigment. And th this is an issue because th that's a racial or a, a, a race and pigment oriented bias, but this, these type of biases exist in all technology because as I said in, a, in an earlier producer function, you have to assume that whoever is making the technology, especially in digital space, they are using their own personal standards and their personal subjective experience in, in a lot of cases to specify what the technology can do, how it works, and what the actual conditions for satisfaction are with said technology. So when we start getting like digital devices, we talk th this, the context we talked about it before on this channel was talking about like digital representations of some of these classic hardware devices that we all love, like the SP 1200 and you know, all these like vintage, um, vintage emulations where someone has done a lot of really subjective analysis in a lot of cases. There is, there is definitely some objective scientific um, things that are implemented into the development of this, but a lot of times when we convert something to digital, we often will remove or omit certain aspects that maybe someone found to be subjectively more cumbersome or subjectively not as appealing or we may subjectively decide that a certain aspect of the, the physical or hardware version is the most appealing or most important part to focus on and miss out on other nuances that someone else may subjectively experience when they're using said hardware. And I think that this is always going to be a challenge, especially in the field of technology where there just happens to be um, less diversity, ultimately. Diversity is important in the development of technology to ensure that a large set of people can actually use technology. But at the same time, we also have to be open to the idea that just because there is a technology that exists doesn't mean that it will ever work for everybody. Some technology just won't work for everybody. And I think we have to be okay with that, but we have to also be open to the idea that other people may find a use for other technology just based on their own subjective or individual experiences and individual needs or individual physiology and other requirements that are unique to us as individuals. So it's important for us to look at it from that perspective and to continue to search for things that will help us to get the most out of the thing that we're trying to do within this domain. Um, that's kind of the basis of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, hopefully that wasn't too long winded. I'm gonna get to the, um, the chat room as well, but that's kind of the framework of what I wanted to talk about. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm prototyping this, this two handed, um, mouse interaction, two handed trackball interaction. I, it's, it's actually helping out a lot. It's helping me to, 
have a bit more accuracy and a, a bit more comfort, but I, I will keep you updated as I continue to play with that and continue to iterate on that concept a bit more. But I just think everybody out there, you know, it's okay to have different requirements. It's, it's okay to have different, um, different things that you want to use within your setup, especially to navigate the digital domain, because it is very dangerous for us to use any type of one size fits all solution for technology, considering that a lot of technology is not tested on a diverse set of people. All right, that's a mouthful, and I know you guys are like, dang, is, is he ever going to respond to my question? I'm going to get to the questions, y'all. I appreciate y'all listening to me. Those of y'all that are on um, on Instagram, just, just FYI, I'm also on YouTube as well. YouTube um, is a little bit of a different setup for me, um, but if you um, want to hear better quality audio or if I have to play any audio or if I have to do any screen shares or anything, Go to my YouTube. This this will also this stream will also be uh, available for as a replay on YouTube. I'll keep it up there. But I just wanted to let my fam on Instagram know this is a simulcast right now. I'm going on YouTube and Instagram. Just wanted to share it with everybody just in case you want to watch it on YouTube. Uh, my link the link to my YouTube is in my bio just in case you want to check that out. Let's get to it. Um. Man, what's good? What's good, y'all? I appreciate y'all. Um, shops is is that how I um, pronounce that? Shops as is the MPC two thousand XL still worth buying? Um, sure. It, I, you know, you know what's great about a lot of that technology is like a lot of those old devices um, still do what they did when they first were released. And I think that's an amazing part of those standalone units is that they get a, um, they're not on the, they're not on the up, up, update train and update pathology that software tends to have. So I think as far as a, a standalone unit like an MPC 2000 XL, which hasn't received the new firmware in over a decade, I believe now. It still does what it was designed to do when they released, I forgot the, the last OS, but I think the last OS was the OS designed for the, um, the MPC 2000 XL MCD, which had the card reader and all that stuff, right? So it still does what it's supposed to do. It still has the, the two MIDI in, two MIDI out set up. It still has the 32 megabytes of um, RAM. It still has whatever, whatever you know, sampling time that um, that equates to. It still has its um, options for eight outs and the option for the effect card. It still has that, and if you get one that has all of that, it still does all of that. So if you need a drum machine sampling device that has 16 pads, that has um, you know minutes of sampling time, that has the ability to um, sequence hundreds of thousands of MIDI notes, um, to access up to 32 different MIDI channels, it still does that. So I guess the real question is, what, what are your real requirements for, or what are you trying to accomplish with your music production? That's the real question because I think the value is um, more subjective. The value that you will personally get is more subjective because it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and what type of process and um, what type of characteristics you're trying to get out of that process. Um, I don't think the MPC 2000 XL is great for someone that just wants to like really quickly and like um, work in a real modern way because it's not a quick device by today's standards 
to load up drums and to sample into and to chop things up and all of that kind of stuff can be a little bit more cumbersome by today's standards where you have things like, you know, the MPC-1 and the MPC, X and the Live and Machine and the Force and, you know, even the Digitact and all these other things that do stuff so much faster than that. I think if you're looking for quick workflow, if you're working for more modern storage and all these other types of things, it may not be worth it. But I think what, what is interesting about the MPC 2000 XL, besides the stuff that I said still works, is also the, the tonal qualities of it. I did a um, kind of like, not, not a scientific experiment, but we did like a, a brief experiment kind of comparing um, the MPC 2000 XL to the 4000 in machine on my channel years back, just kind of comparing one use case. It, it wasn't a comprehensive thing where we tested converters and we tested the filters and we tested all these different aspects of both devices or, or all three devices, but it was just simple like sample playback and just the quality of um, the audio coming out was definitely different from the 2000 XL, the 4000 and the machine. So I think there's something to be said if you're into using samplers to manipulate sound to get different tonal character and quality. So I think it could be worth it for that purpose as well. So yeah, that's, that's the short, long answer to that question. Um, hopefully that helps. Um, let me know. <laughs> let me see. What's, what other questions y'all have? Um, Shop says, what drum machines are you using still? Or no, what drum machines are you still using? Sorry. Um, a lot. Um, actually, <laughs> I, I, I like to play with a lot of different drum machines because um, I think different drum machines just have different um, behavior and characteristics that are inspiring. I'm still heavily using the Machine MK3. That's like probably, I still use that for a lot of stuff actually. Um, it's not in view right now, but um, my machine is down here um so it's very close when i'm using when i'm when i'm on the keyboard i like it actually down here because it's just quick for me to get to but i'm using it all the time um i'm using the electron model cycles um i've been using that for almost a year now and i i really enjoy that one that one has some pretty interesting characteristics that um are unique of course the electron sequencer and there's a lot of other aspects of it that i like but it's it's a fun device that i use for things that are different from um the machine um mpc 500 i use sometimes as well um just for quick stuff if i don't want to get too complex about you know I, I think everybody's writing process is different, so I think sometimes I just want a quick sampler to just jam out with and kind of um, use in the, the old MPC way. I still have my 4000, but sometimes I don't want to get into like locking into the, the, the idea of the 4000 because I think the 4000 kind of leads me to a down a different path. I, I, I think my inclination with the 4000 is to use it more as a centerpiece. And I think right now, currently, like I'm not, I'm not really um, working in the MPC concept where I use the drum machine as the centerpiece for the entire production at this point. I think that for me right now, just right now, that may change later. I may get inspired to actually do that again, but right now I'm not doing that. So um, yeah, MPC 500, machine, model cycles um yeah those are the main ones right now um i do have a, a behringer rd8 as well i use that sometimes but I, I i sample a lot of that stuff and use it in machine actually so um i, I don't find that the rd8 um sequencer is necessary for me it's it, it it's not necessarily inspiring for me to use that i, I think 
Um, I like the idea of the analog tone generator with the RD8, but as far as like actually using a 808 style sequencer, not that is not as inspiring for me as using say the electron sequencer with all of the um, conditional um, trigs and all the other things that you can do with um, the electron. So that's, that's, that's the main drum machines that I'm using right now. Um, Calvin Rodriguez says, um, I see this bias in plugins and effects that are geared towards certain genres and style sounds. All of it is leaning pop. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely true. Genre has a huge impact on the, the biases that are leaned into with software and hardware for that matter. I, I think that genre oftentimes can kind of put emphasis on things that may be important for the sound of a specific genre, but may, it, it may overlook things that are important for other types of music producers. So I think it's important that we understand how genre can also impact um, the manufacturing and development of software and hardware. Because I also believe that if you look at it from that perspective, then you can see how um, genre also has some other implications. Because genre, if we look at how genre is set up, genre can also have implications of demographic, um, fortunately and unfortunately, right? Um, when you say urban, that is a genre classification but it also has implications on a demographic. So if something say is made for an urban audience, then it may be considering a um, demographic that looks a certain way, right? Um, when a product is made for pop music, pop also kind of has its own implications of demographic. Um, and that means that some, if something is pop leaning, it may um, miss the nuances and details and, and subjective things that are important for someone that is not considered pop, right? So a lot of those biases exist within the tools that we use and just the technology that we use. So that's a great point. Like this whole genre concept is another area where biases are inherent. Um, What's up, Filthy Rich? Um, Filthy Rich says, what's your take on the new SP-1200 from David, David Rossum that's about to drop? Great question. Um, I don't know much about it, to be honest. I've looked at you know some of the, the rollout and I've seen some producers talking about it and a lot of like legendary producers have um, of course, backed it. Um, th there's different reasons for why they've backed it. I think some people have collaborated or, you know, partners or affiliates and that there's all kind of little implications of why they're backing it. But I think ultimately the SP-1200 is um, a classic unit that has become highly acclaimed. It's become highly coveted. And I, I think ultimately there, there's an audience for it and they're very expensive now. So people are looking for ways to tap into the aesthetic that the SP-1200 provides for music producers. So I think the fact that there's a new one that's coming to the market is a great look, but I also think that um, it, it comes with, you know, some some caveats as well um from what i've heard and this is just hearsay i don't know like i said i don't know everything about it but i've heard that this particular one is not necessarily a um rebuilding of the unit i or not i should say it, it's not really a new manufacturing run of the unit what i've heard is that this has more to do with um a refurbishing um, of a lot of units. So I, I guess there's 
some type of refurbishing or there's there was some type of buyback campaign and a refurbishing that may have happened at some point so i think that that's really what this is about but i'm not sure uh, i could be wrong but this is just what i've heard as hearsay um, word on the street is that there there is some degree of that going on so it, it may not be a a new run or a new manufacturing run of the sp1200 but more so a um, refurbishing and these units are being built based off of old units that you know have been just brought up to a certain spec and maybe put given a, a fresh um, face plate so we'll see how this really turns out but it's interesting I, I I think that it'll be good for people that can afford the price I, I think the price point of this um, new unit is still not cheap it's still like four thousand dollars so you know, I, I think that that's not going to help a lot of us. I think the um, the S2400 that came out, the um, I think the Isla product that's more in the 1500 range, that seems to be more of a reasonable thing that helps people to get into that realm of the SP1200. So, um, but yeah, it, if you're into nostalgia and you're into like having something that feels like a significant like hardware, Obviously, you know, you, you can't go wrong with the the legacy of the SP-1200. Um, just call me Jabbar. What's good? I see you. I, I'm going to go to the, um, the Instagram. I've been kind of favoring the YouTube channel. So let me let me go to the Instagram as well. Um, Remnant, what's going on with you? Um, he says, thoughts on the metaverse. <laughs> That's that, that could be a whole... Um, a whole video in itself and I probably will cover that at some point like a an entire video really kind of going through like the metaverse and really starting to look at it for music producers um, I think it what interestingly enough I think music producers have kind of been some of the biggest pioneers in the metaverse concept um, we I think music producers have been like one of the earliest communities outside of like the gaming community, obviously. But I think the music producer community especially have been um, big pioneers in um, adopting a metaverse concept. Um, we, we have been like one of the biggest um, cohorts of um, people out here that are using um, digital um, computers to... Um, effectively do things that we would normally do in the physical domain. Um, I think, you know, a DAW technically, uh, a DAW and virtual instruments fit into a metaverse concept because, you know, we're essentially creating a virtual studio with our DAW and how we tool it out with different VSTs and, and whatnot. So I think a lot of us are already playing with a metaverse concept when you start to look at the combination of our DAWs and also, you know, nowadays our, our digital um, identity as music producers. We all have a different digital identity. Um, the Remnant 47 is a... Um, digital identity um that that is an identity that is representing you in a digital space and this is how you navigate the digital world and that's how i know you now i think you specifically i've seen you in person i think we've run into each other in la but the reality is i know you as the remnant 47 i don't know you as you know your your government name so I, I interact with you that way. But I think the combination of me interacting with you on social media as um, the remnant, plus the idea that you make music most likely in a digital space in a DAW means that we are already like highly, highly um, already well adopted to a degree in a metaverse concept. And I think that it, it will be interesting to see how the developments are um, tooled out and rolled out for the music producer community. Because I feel like right now, we, we are all working with digital, but 
What is missing still are the real time synchronous collaborative tools, because right now a lot of us in the music production space are using asynchronous tools. Um, when I mean asynchronous, I, I mean like we are not working together at the same time on music over the internet right now. And I, I've always found that to be like one of the most frustrating parts about um, our digital metaverse, so to speak, as music producers. Because, um, you know, when I was in college, um, I, I had a, a, a whole lot of people around and we would always collaborate. Um, in my studio, uh, mo most everybody would come like on campus um, to, to jam and make beats and do all kind of stuff in, in my um, bedroom studio on campus. So, you know, the whole idea of collabor collaborative, synchronous um, collaboration has always been a big deal for me because it's always been where I've had some of the most in inspiring um, in inspiring uh, experiences as a music producer. But, you know, in this world where we're, we're all working on individual dolls, it would be great to have some type of synchronous ability. Right now, I think the solutions that we use are, are asynchronous. So, you, you know, upload this to Dropbox or upload this to, you know, other said collaboration tool. And then I pull down the, um, pull down the file and I use it. Now there are some tools that allow you to, um, share audio now within a DAW. There's some interesting concepts around that and being able to transfer a file in real time within a VST. I, I, I forget there was one, I, I forgot the name of it now, but I, there's a couple of different concepts, but I would love to see us get to a place where, our world is kind of more like what is possible in the um, the gaming world, where you have this multiplayer online concept where we can all kind of like, you know, have spaces that we're 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 working in, and if someone wants to step into my studio and collaborate with me in real time, that they can do so, and we can jam out and get some stuff done, and we can kind of studio hop within the digital domain. That's the kind of stuff I can't wait to see. That's the kind of stuff that I, I um, and what I welcome as far as a metaverse concept. How close are we to that? I don't know that we're close to that at all, to be honest. I think that you know, the metaverse and the company meta is promising a lot of great conceptual stuff. But we got a lot of bur we got a lot of challenges to get to there. And I think, um, you know, the, the metaverse in order for it to be realized the way that we're talking about, I think we're going to have to give up a lot as well. Um, I think we're going to have to give up a whole lot in order to get to a place where you have this, you know, interoperability as they as they call it to have everything working together. Um, I, I think I think we're gonna have to give up a lot. And you know, when I say give up a lot, give up a lot, I'm thinking, you know, one thing is a single sign-on. I, I think that that's an inevitable thing that we probably will have to give up is just the right to have a um, some type of anonymous um, relationship with a platform. Um, I, I think in order for there to be like true interoperability, there will probably have to be some type of single sign-on system that allows you to accept a single terms and condition that allows different platforms to share all this information and your digital identity um, within that space so that your avatar and all these attributes of who you are as a um, digital person or whatever are transferred and that there is true interoperability through these different um, di different contact points within the metaverse. I think that that's going to be something that you know we're going to have to figure out and we're going to either accept or not accept but um, I think it's 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 kind of um, 
it's it's a challenge. And I, I, I worry about some of it. I worry about a lot of it, actually. Not like I'm stressed over, but I just worry about it in terms of like I'm thinking about it more so. I, let me let me use the right words. I think about it a lot more so. Maybe not worry is maybe too harsh of a word. I think about it a lot because I think that, um, you know, in order for there to be this, you know, um, this level of single sign on and interoperability, I think that there's going to be a requirement for um, significantly stronger KYC or know your customer protocols where we have to give up a lot more information to a platform so that the platform truly knows who we are and we can, can truly um, authenticate who we are within these different spaces because I think we'll be able to be anonymous, so to speak, once we are in the metaverse, but I think the platforms that are connected to the metaverse will all have to more deeply know who you are. You won't necessarily have this simply transactional relationship. I think you'll have to have a deeper relationship where they have a lot more of your information and they are now responsible for all of that information. So I, I think that this is, this, these are real challenges. These are real concerns that we're gonna have to evaluate and see if it makes sense for us. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical that we'll get all this other, all this like, you know, collaborative stuff early. I think this, the big, bur big hurdle will be the interoperability and the single sign on and the terms and conditions that'll be necessary for uh, all of this to work. And th this will be a decision that we'll all have to make. Do we want these platforms to have the amount of control of our information and the free domain to share said information within the space and control that control that information these these are questions i'm not saying that it's it's right or wrong but i think we all have the ability to question it and we all should question it and think about it and make some decisions and start to figure out where we stand on this as well because I, I, I do have some concerns with a single entity that is not the government having all that information and being able to manipulate it and do as they will with it. So um, those are some quick thoughts on the metaverse. That was very quick. That, that, I, I think the metaverse is such a deep concept. And I, I will, on a subsequent producer function, I will cover that as more of a, a, a broader or, or just I would say we'll, we'll go deeper into that and we'll we'll start to like really look at pros and cons and what we're you know really talk about what we're looking forward to and you know what we think about it and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well so um, this is a topic that obviously is very early but we should be talking about it so I appreciate that question for sure I'm gonna go to another question in um, IG um, Erotonin says, um, how do you go about with mastering chains? Another very, um, actually a complex question. Um, I, I will, I will simplify it because I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, I think mastering is, um, a game of creating um, the correct sonic um, setup for a specific medium. So I think it depends on what medium you are mastering for, because obviously we, if, if, you're, if you're familiar with mastering, you, it's, it's about tailoring the audio for consumption on a specific medium. And there are different standards that are, that are requirements for different um, media types. So, for example, for a um, for uh, for vinyl, there is um, a such thing as a RIAA curve that kind of um, dict it not kind of it does dictate the frequency bands that are applicable to vinyl, and you have to make sure that your music is mastered in a way where it obeys or fits within the RIAA curve so that it can be properly played on a record player that has a limited um, frequency spectrum that it can rec represent. So there's no one size fits all on mastering. I think you have to always consider the medium that you are mastering for. 
you have to look at what are the requirements and standards for um, that, that particular medium and make sure that you have the loudness and the frequency spectrum and all of those things considered. Um, so there's not one chain that you can use for mastering. There's going to be a multitude of things that you have to do depending on where you expect the music to be consumed or consumed or played. So um, I think there's some software like, you know, Isotope Ozone, for example, has a lot of different templates and things that you can use. So if you want that type of like more, you know, AI and computerized mastering, that can be an option. I think depending on, you know, how you're going to distribute the, the music or audio will determine what mastering tool you use. In some cases, I don't believe that um, those types of mastering um, platforms are the, um, the, the best to use because I think that those tools don't, sometimes they don't deal with um, phase correction, for example, because, um, you know, audio, um, especially multi-track audio, um, they all have different timing, um, but like the sounds in the music all have different timing. And in order to maximize the loudness and maximize the clarity of the audio, it's important to have the phase relations, the, time, the actual timing and phase relation of the, the waves and the audio. They have to be aligned in a way that maximizes their, their ability to be heard. And I think a lot of these uh, mastering tools don't necessarily, don't necessarily fix the um, phase correlation of individual tracks. So I think in some cases it's better to go with the actual mastering um, engineer that will address the phase issues that your audio has. So I think this is important, like when we start talking about mastering, I think there's a, you can do some mastering for like, you know, um, digital streaming and, and, and whatnot that can be a, a little bit more broad. Um, but I, I think a lot of these tools and our mastering chains, I think the mastering chain is one part, like the texturing and the, the um, frequency spectrum and the, um, the amplitude um, and dynamic processing that you use and the spatial processing that you use. That's one element of it, but I also think that mastering also has to do with getting phase correlations correct as well. So um, yeah, that's the short answer. I, there's not like a single chain. I don't, I don't believe in the concept of a, a single chain for mastering because I think mastering always has to do with mastering for a specific medium. All right, I'm gonna go to YouTube. Um, let's see here. YouTube fam, let's see here. Dope Snare says, what kind of stand are you rocking for the MK3? I'm curious about maybe getting it off the computer desk. Actually, I'm using a snare stand, um, like a, a, a actual snare stand for like a, a snare drum. I'm just, I've basically just put um, the MK3 in this, in this um, stand here. Let me see if I can pull that up. It's a, it's a snare stand. So, um, it's low, it locks in, it works. Um, it's not going to be perfect for everybody. It's not a perfect solution for everybody, but I, I've, I've used the, um, machines and snare stands for quite some time actually. So, um, it, it always has worked for me, but you know, it, your, your mileage may vary. Um, I'm, looks like I'm at about an hour on the, um, the IG stream. So if you're on IG, I would actually recommend you head over to my YouTube. If you want to continue watching this, um, there is a link in my bio. So if you want to go over to the YouTube and continue watching, please do. I recommend it that that's, that's where the action will continue. So, I, but I appreciate y'all that join me on this, um, IG stream. But yeah, we're gonna continue on YouTube. So um, head over there if you want to really um, communicate with the audience. I have, you know, a, a large audience over there. So um, let's continue to get it in. But I appreciate y'all on IG, and yeah, let's let's continue. All right. So this will end, and um, I'll holler at y'all. Hope to see y'all on the YouTube stream.
Pharaoh's kingdom. What's good with you, fam? Um, let's see here. Filthy Rich says, oh, no, that was the 35th, 35th anniversary edition going for 7500 This one is brand new. Got you, got you. Okay, I, I was confusing the two then. I, I apologize for that. Um, let's see here. Ross Silly says 5G will change that. I think 5G will um, give us more access to... Um, more devices that will allow us to collaborate and connect with real time. I, I, I think the challenge is going to be just the um, development. I think we're going to have to make some decisions around the development because I think ultimately one of the challenges is 5G doesn't solve the problem of us having access to all of the instruments and devices that we use in our DAWs right now. I think that's the big challenge. Like we can have all the 5G we want, but realistically for the music producers, if we can't use all of the VSTs and all the, all the software that we've um, grown to love as music producers, if that has no interoperability within the metaverse, then the 5G does not solve that. So I think one of the big problems is going to be the interoperability and just having access to the things that we are used to using. Because I, I, I doubt that music producers are going to switch and say, okay, you know, Meta has some new tools that um, cover all of music producers' basic needs. And they, you know, if say Meta makes a, a loop, um, a loop playback system or some type of loop manipulation system that allows you to use, say, loops from their library and loops from other users and manipulate it and create music. I doubt that all of us will like switch over and say, I'm just going to use that and nothing else. We're going to want to use the stuff that we've been used to using in the digital domain. And I think that's the problem and that's not solved by 5G. So it'll be interesting to see how this is solved, but I, I have an inclination that it will be a very slow development for us to, it'll be a very slow process for us to get access. And these um, developers that control a lot of the, the stuff that we like to use now within the digital space as music producers, I think a lot of that stuff is gonna take a long time for it to be um, accessible and interoperable interoperable within um, the digital space. So that's gonna be a challenge. G-Ball says the single sign-on may be handled via blockchain. Um, I, I, you know, I think when we're talking metaverse, you, you can't uh, ignore that there's a blockchain implication. I, I think that ultimately what I'm talking about when I say single sign-on is still, um, it still requires some entity to validate and verify who you are. Um, I think that we can talk about decentralization all we want, but the reality is right now, Coinbase is Coinbase, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're into crypto and blockchain and all that, Coinbase is still Coinbase, right? So when we start talking about like a fiat on-ramp, for example, like to get your fiat currency into, um, the blockchain, you have to use some type of fiat on-ramp. And uh, on-ramp like Coinbase, it, sure, it, it has blockchain implementation, but it's still somewhat centralized. So, and the, Coinbase requires a KYC. You have to, they have to know, they, they, they do some validation to know their customer. And I think the degree of um, KYC necessary to, represent a person in digital space is going to be greater. I think it's going to be much, much of a, a it, it potentially is going to be a much more invasive KYC in order for a single sign on to work in the metaverse. Um, shop says music should be affected more from crypto. There's no that there's not that much change except for selling NFTs. Um, 
I, I think some of it is dependent on what we do, right? Like, I think adoption right now, the concept we're using is like this NFT smart contract thing. And I think we, we, I think we really haven't leveraged the smart contract thing the way that it, it, it should be or the way it could be. It could be used for so much more than um, exploitation uh, or access to our, our digital assets right now. I think that's one concept, but it's not the only concept that can exist within the smart contract, um, within smart contract technology. So I, I feel like there's a lot more that we could do, but I think there are so many different stakeholders within the music space and some of it is gate kept. You know, some of it is gate kept because it's, it's hard to transition to a thing that you don't have control over, where you don't have the ability to extract. If, if, you, if you have a system right now where it's making you money and you are on the receiving end of a lot of the money because you've built out the frameworks and, and the current um, infrastructure that that industry uses, it's hard for you to relinquish that and give it to some other entity essentially and let them become basically the master of the infrastructure and have access to a lot of the money that you are receiving. So I think that's what's happening in the music space right now. You got a lot of that going on. So, um, yeah, we'll see. But I, I think that, that that's the real issue. Zach M is talking about auto line and he's talking about for phase relation. So yeah, I agree. Auto line is, um, auto line is, is a good tool. Um, I agree with that. Um, High Tech 909 says, um, didn't know you were on. Looking forward to your discourse while I work out a little. That's what's up. I appreciate you, fam. Um, let's see. Zach M says, check out the Amazon vase amount arm and bracket human centric, like $40 um, for a stand that mounts on your desk table. Now, I appreciate that. I'm working on a new setup right now, so I haven't. I haven't set up all my different brackets and arms yet, but I appreciate that. I'll check that out. That's a good look. Um, Cause yeah, I'm, I'm messing with a new streaming device right now. That, so, you know, I, for a while I wasn't able to stream because I, I had some issues with the computer setup and OBS. I'm no longer using OBS. So I got a, a, a different setup and yeah, it's, it's, Hopefully it's going good. Y'all can let me know if this new setup works and um, if it if it if it sounds and looks good. Um, but yeah, that's the um, that's kind of why I keep looking down. But I, I have a couple stands, but I haven't set up a stand for the new streaming device yet. So that's why I keep looking down over here at the um, the comment section. <laughs> um, Let's see. Civil Day says they still have to retrofit technology authentication at all the remote servers. I agree. Um, there's a lot of technology that has to be updated. Um, Civil Day's KYC is um, know your customer. That is a authentication um, procedure that certain banks and other organizations and um, firms that may have to deal with finances and other types of sens sensitive um, data um, used to authenticate and validate who you are as a person. So they may, a KYC, a common KYC may ask you to upload a copy of your driver's license to validate who you are. Like KYC, upload a your, your driver driver's license to our server or upload your passport to our server or, um, you know, some other things. Some other companies have other types of KYC um, and validation protocols that they'll use. But um, yeah, that's, that's what a KYC is. KYC is just like a, a, a authentication strategy that can be used. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's that. Um, I'm gonna get into this now that I'm not on um, on IG. I'm gonna try to get a little deeper into this chat. So bear with me. Appreciate y'all that's been hanging out all 
all 30 of y'all. And if you haven't already liked this, um, please go ahead and like this. I appreciate uh, the likes and the follows and everything else, but definitely like this and um, share it. You know, if you, um, if you feel so inclined, I know a lot of music producers like to hang out and talk about, you know, technology and whatnot. That's what we're talking about right now, music technology. But um, yeah, go ahead and share this on Twitter or wherever else you like to share. Um, stuff that you're watching if you so feel inclined. But I appreciate y'all that's been hanging out with me. Um, Calvin Rodriguez says, the problem with any of it is that the people that want are not the people that make what is needed. In the future, in addition to making beats, beat makers and producers will have to design apps. Now that, my friend is a fact. And I've said this before. Some of us need to make some decisions about what we're really going to do and what, what our, what our purpose and mission here is ultimately. I think that there's a lot of great talent, a lot of, um, a lot of amazing minds in the music production space. And I think there's, there's opportunity for a lot of us that are in this space to use our minds and our capabilities to develop the technology of the future. I've told you guys this before. If the digital world does not have what you need right now, especially on the digital side, hardware is a different thing, but on the digital side, Learn the code. You guys can make this stuff too. And it's becoming more and more accessible. There's all these different types of platforms that allow you to build audio apps in ways that are modern and efficient. And it, it, a lot of it doesn't require as much basic coding as it used to. Like, uh, for example, there is a platform called Juice, J-U-C-E. Look into it. Juice is a platform that you can use to build music production applications. Um, another, an, another platform is, um, what is it? Audio Toolkit, I believe it is. Let me, make sure I'm saying this right. I believe it's audio toolkit, but there's a lot of platforms and these platforms allow us to get into creating music production software. Like you guys can get into this too. Is it dead simple where you don't have to know anything? Of course not. Of course not. We're talking about building apps. We're talking about building technology. You're of course, you're, you of course have to practice. You, you, you may need to work with more advanced, more seasoned, um, producers and, um, more seasoned coders and create a network of people that you work with to build, um, technology, but you have access. Don't ever believe that you don't have access to this. Yeah, Audio Toolkit was the other one I was looking at. Uh, Audio Toolkit is a BSD licensed DSP library for audio real-time processing. There's a, there are a lot, there are a lot of um, platforms that you can use. And a lot of us will have to use our, um, a, lot of the, a, a lot of the coming opportunity will be for those of us that have a lot of music production experience and understand what the requirements are. A lot of us that have these, um, this deep understanding of what the requirements to make music are, we'll have to leverage that to help build out the metaverse and create the items that allow people to make music within the digital domain. That's going to be a big opportunity for a lot of us that are in this music production space that have some technical abilities that can get out, get out there and start looking at how can we start to 
create things that are useful within a metaverse concept for music producers and people that want to um, produce music for that matter. So I believe that that's where we should be focusing. We should be spending some time strategizing there and thinking about what the next step is and how we want to continue to populate the digital world. Because content is one thing. A lot of us, I think a lot of us make content right now. Um, you know, obviously I, I got this YouTube channel. I also have like, a, you know, beat side and my website and all kind of stuff, right? So that's populating one, that's populating the web 2.0 digital space with the audio and the video and the social media and all that stuff, right? But the next step is gonna be, um, looking at how we can build the metaverse and use some of our trade experience and, and understanding to translate that into a concept that has interoperability within the metaverse. So um, I would say take some time to decide because content, like I said, that's one aspect of it. That's one element that we can be doing. It's not the only thing. And a lot of times we, we, we talk about, you know, man, you know, I, I'm just, I just want to get a placement. I just want to get, you know, an opportunity. A lot of the biggest opportunities lie in building tools for other people to make music. It's not, it, it's not just about the content. I think the content is an opportunity, but the content game has become a game to find the next big personality. That's not me personally. You know, I do this YouTube stuff, but I'm not a YouTuber. I, I, t I always tell you all that I'm not a YouTuber. Um, I'm not the guy. I'm not the, the personality for, um, you know, everybody, right? I'm, I have a specific personality. It works for my audience. I appreciate y'all. I love y'all and respect y'all. But I, I, I am very realistic about who I am as a person. And I understand that my personality is not the personality that necessarily is going to be um, for everybody. So therefore, as a content person, it's difficult because I think there's a lot of things that have to work together in order for you to have success with a content based strategy. Um, but I think when you start to go to that next level, say you're going to develop tools that becomes a little bit more equalizing in a sense. It's, it's not so much about your personality. Now you might have to work with personalities to, to, um, roll out a marketing campaign and all that good stuff. Right. But that's, that's further down. I think ultimately, um, coding is, is equal opportunity. Now, is it equally accessed and equally utilized? No, it's definitely not equally accessed and utilized. And I think some people have, um, inherently they have built in advantages that help them to get access to learning coding and um, learning computers and even just access to computers in general. Um, a lot of people don't grow up with a computer that um, they, they can use when they're smaller or a child. They, they don't have access to a computer that they can use to start coding. And then, you know, I, I know a lot of kids that don't have uh, have a computer that is their own. So they have to share a computer with their, their parents. And then it's like, okay, how are they going to learn the code? If the parent is trying to use the computer to handle their business and you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there, there's inherent challenges and disadvantages that exist within this domain that are socioeconomic. But ultimately I say, you know, if you're an adult and you, you know, you have the opportunity to, um, set yourself up with the technology, a computer, and you know, you have the patience to start working and learning how to code. You should learn to code and you should learn to um, at least prototype things that you can take to someone else that has a little bit more um, experience with um, coding to develop a product that, that fits 
what your concept is. I think that's how it, it works. Like you have, you should know how to prototype. I think that's, that's an important aspect is like learning how to prototype, learning how to use certain tools to prototype and using that prototype to kind of establish what the, um, what the behavior of your software tool is and what the requirements are. And then you can use that prototype to establish what is required for a developer to build for you. And that's kind of how building applications work. So you can do it. You guys can do that. So I, I may be oversimplifying some aspects of it and I'm trying to keep it simple, but you guys can do this too. So you guys should be doing this. Um, Let's see, Civil Days says remote authentication like its links. Yeah, yep. Um, CX, the producer says they use limited tokens. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I thought about that to have more control over my music. Yeah, um, let me see here. Audio Toolkit, yep, yep, CX. Um, Quantum Medic Music says, coding is where it's at, it's free. We can also free ourselves making our own plugins, attending the seminar for Sonic Pi. You can change your performance in real time with lines of code. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Calvin Rodriguez says, going to try it. I hope everyone else does. We don't have to wait. You don't. You don't at all. Um, I, I, I want to see more. Uh, music producers in that space. I think there's a lot of people that are bringing a high level of technology and um, computer science to the, the, the field, but not a lot of deep music production and just music creation discipline to it. And I think that's where some of the tools tend to lack. Um, so, I would love to see a lot more music producers in the the space of music technology. You know, I've, I've worked in music technology. Wow, it's been since 2005. I, my first um, venture in music technology was with Yamaha. Um, and I worked with them as a consultant for about six years. No, not, not six years. Well, actually, yeah, six years. I, I actually started working with them in 2003, but I started to do like actual, like sound design work for them in 2005. So it was 2003 to 2009. And then from 2009 to the present, I've worked with Native Instruments. So I've been in the music technology space for a long time now. Um, wow, yeah, a long time now. Um, it's got to be more music producers in that space, like folks that have this deep understanding of um, what the requirements are so that we can see new innovative ideas and concepts. That's that's important. Um, Shop says, what do you think of Tracklib? I like the idea of Tracklib as far as it making sampling on a professional level more accessible. I think that that is a great idea to kind of standardize the, um, the, the clearance of samples and the licensing of music. Um, obviously there's not going to be a, as large of a um, audience for some of it because I think a lot of people are not into licensing music. It's interesting, I, I, I kind of feel like there's a lot of producers that want to license their music, but maybe not necessarily license music. You know what I'm saying? So it's an interesting paradox, you know, like you want your music to get placed, but you don't necessarily want to pay for it. Like we, that, that, those are like kind of mental thing, games that we play with ourselves as music producers sometimes. I, I've seen that, um, where I first saw that obviously was with the um, software, right? Like a lot of people 
use software that they haven't paid for. You know, everybody's done that before at, at some point, I'm sure. Um, not casting judgment, but I think ultimately when you start to look at um, your desire to want to be paid as a music producer, it's important for you to invest in um, your production. It's your equipment, it's your personnel, um, it's the content that you use and the ideas that you use. So TrackLib is a way for us to get access to high quality productions that are um, now accessible for us to use in our own productions as samples. So it's a great alternative to some of the royalty-free concepts that you would get from something like Sounds.com or Splice or you know Big Fish Audio or you know some of these other platforms, right? So I think it's a great thing to have another option that feels closer to like the essence of sample-based music production where it, it was typically based off of using records um, from published music, because I think that's the difference. I think there's, some, there's something to be said about sampling published music as opposed to um, royalty-free. And that, that's a whole different conversation we can get into, but um, I, I, I think that when music is published, it typically invokes a certain quality of um, expression that you may not get from royalty free. I think royalty free can be great for a lot of things where um, you may not necessarily require deep levels of emotional impact and, and expression to be present. I think that's where it really is like very powerful. Like royalty free is great when you need like, say like some drum one shots, for example. I think drum one shots is a very great case for royalty free where it's like, I can just go download that and use it. And it's like, you know, it's royalty free. I don't have to pay um, additional royalties to continue to use it because it's not really a high level of um, emotional expression there's no like necessarily there's not necessarily like an apex of expression within the one shot sample domain so i think a one shot sample like drums or sound effects for example great place to just stick with royalty free um i think that royalty free can lack um power when it's about um things that are designed or things that typically require a deep level of expression to inspire. And I think that's where published music is um, an advantage. When, you, when you're looking to hear a moment of music that represents what I would call like the apex of expression. This is another thing I'm gonna talk about later on a different stream, but this whole concept of like loops and like what loops really represent and how we should be careful with um, forcing ourselves into just loops because loops imply that um, you kind of have already identified the apex of expression. And that's difficult to do when you're writing new music, but that's a different topic, so I won't get into that. But essentially I think loops um, like royalty free loops can be a challenge if you're looking to get the apex of expression where you hear that, that one critical moment of the record where it's like, yo, I need to loop that section. If I loop that section right there, that'll be fire. And then I can do this, this and that with it. That's, that's difficult to get out of a royalty free loop library. Um, for a lot of reasons, but I would say some of them are financial. Some of them, some, some of it is just like, just, just straight common sense, right? Like it's hard to say that you're going to let someone else have access to a, a high level of like your top expression of emotion and creativity in perpetuity with no relationship to the, the music. That, that's difficult. That's difficult for us to let go of as a musician. And I, I don't necessarily um, disagree with the concept of not wanting to have that type of music be available 
as royalty free. So Tracklib gives you this concept where it's like, yes, it's published music. So that means someone already published it and they were already comfortable with the terms of releasing um, some music that contains, again, uh, this is, this is a, a term that I'm coining, but it's not necessarily like the proper term, but it's the ape, uh, what I would call the apex of expression within that particular song. So there's a moment or a section or a segment or a phrase or idea within that song that can represent a apex or a very high point of the music that um, would typically be the inspiring part that you want to sample. And that that track lib concept allows someone that has um, already published it, published that music, it allows them to license it directly to a consumer for a um, preset um, preset rate, which is, I, I think, a great, great opportunity. So I know that was kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I, like, I like to kind of give context to where, our, um, where I'm thinking because I, I think that it's easy for someone, what I'm saying, to be um, construed. And, you know, I, I don't like to, even though, you know, some of y'all, some of y'all know, I work, uh, like, I, I'm the product manager for, for sounds.com. There's, I, I am not, um, I'm not here to sell you on any platform. I think if there is an opportunity for you to get value from something like say sounds.com or anything else for that matter, I will express that, but I think we're talking specific. So I try to keep my, my own biases out of it as much as possible so that we can talk about like where the real value can be extracted and really have objective conversations. So that's my objective opinion about track lib and what value it offers to a music producer. I, I, I think it's, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, Calvin Rodriguez says, um, those challenges are opportunities to go from software to affordable hardware, 3d printer, Arduino, electronics, etc. Some of us can at least try. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, high tech 909 says, just like music is saturated, does this apply to music software? Do you think there's a shortage in music making tools? Just curious what the market for those products is like these days. Now, I think you might have missed what we were talking about with this metaverse concept, right? Like there's gonna be a whole transition to get a lot more music or really content and interaction um, products and tools within the metaverse space. And I don't, I, I'm, I question whether some of the big companies that we're used to um, dealing with will be first to enter that space. I think there's going to be a lot more opportunity for um, others that are new, that have um, less aversion to, or, or ha have a little bit more tolerance to the risk that it would take to develop for, say, the metaverse, right? There's going to be a lot of opportunity to build stuff that has interoperability baked into it that will apply to the metaverse. So I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity for music producers and and music creatives to create music software um, for that concept. I think currently, like when we start talking about like just desktop solutions right now, I think some of it is a little bit tired and, you know, we kind of repeating a lot of the same ideas over and over and over and over and over like that. Yeah, I'm tired of that. But I think there's plenty of opportunity beyond that. I think there's a lot of rehashing. Plus, there, you, we have to also consider there's new generations that are getting into music all the time. So there's always opportunities to revise a concept, add a new flavor, a new way of thinking about it and um, make it more accessible to an audience and consider the specific needs of that new audience. So there's always going to be an opportunity to revise a, a concept that and make it more accessible for modern day. So I don't think it's oversaturated, but I think some concepts are oversaturated. Won't get into details on which ones I believe though. <laughs> um, Mr. Random, what's going on with you fam? Um, Chattel, or Chattel World LLC, I agree. Published music is where, where the magic is at. I agree, yeah. If you're like, if you're like a sample chopper, right? I think royalty free is challenging. Um, published music is, is really, that's, that's where you 
find a lot of the money as far as like just the most inspiring stuff. Um, David Scott says, Malo Beats, a YouTuber, did an A-B comparison of the 2000 XL and the MPC-1, and the differences were almost unnoticeable. I think all, a lot of this is subjective. Um, there's some objective um, ways you can do the comparison. Um, but I would say the frequency band of the MPC-2000 is definitely different from modern MPCs. I, I don't think, for me personally, and this is my subjective opinion, right? Your your ears and what, you, and also we have to also consider what the what the conditions of the test are. We have to be careful with like data and science and and test and whatnot because there's ways to skew a test to certain things, right? Um, I'm not sure what the conditions of the test were if we're talking about the quality of samples that are being loaded into a uh, machine from a hard drive or some type of storage device. If we're talking about sample loading and playback, it also matters what the source material, material is because if you're using material that has a, a, a limited bandwidth of um, frequency spectrum and you put it in both and it kind of matches the constraints of both devices, then you'll, you won't hear as much difference. So if you're like, say you're sampling a record, for example, say you're sampling a record that has um, been mastered using RIAA curve, for example, that's gonna have a, a, a limited spectrum of frequencies already. So if you're comparing that into machines, you might not notice a difference. But if you're comparing, say, directly sampling in, say a 24-bit, um, 96k wave file into both units like a, um, a crash symbol or something you know very high fi high, high fidelity and you sample it in both units um, I highly doubt that they both sound the same um, just from my experience um, I, I definitely experienced issues with certain symbols like you know crash symbols not translating and not not even playing out correctly from um, a MPC 2000 XL versus a MPC 4000 versus machine. So I know just in terms of like frequency spectrum alone, like they, they're not exactly the same, but I think there are sweet spots where they can sound the same. So I think these tests, we have to be very specific about what we're testing and what the conditions of the test are to really make an accurate conclusion of whether two things are um, the same or similar. Um, I, I think sample loading is one test. Sample loading, also you should, like I said, you gotta pay attention to what the frequency band of the samples that are being loaded are. Um, but yeah, there can be some sweet spots with that, but you also have to compare sampling directly through the, um, the inputs and you have to compare that. And then there's also other aspects of like um, these d devices that you have to uh, understand. Everybody's not using them exactly the same. Um, some people are leveraging gain staging to push or um, drive the, the sound that's going into the unit specifically to enhance or texture the sample. So if you're sampling and you're, you're driving one set of converters, um, when I say driving, that could be clipping or overloading even, even. If you're using those types of techniques to texture the sound, then you're gonna have difference, uh, a difference in sound when you start to do that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things that you have to take into consideration when we're doing these A-B tests. I don't think, um, I don't think anyone's done a, an exhaustive um, set of A-B tests to really make a conclusion that there's no difference. But I, I definitely know from experience, from my own experience, that there is a difference just based on like the parameters of the sample content or the source content that you're using. So if, if you start getting to higher def, high, higher fidelity sample content or whatever, you will notice a difference. Um, lower fidelity content, you may not notice as much of a difference because there's going to be a frequency roll off already. Um, 
also, um, I think YouTube is a challenge. If, you, if you're comparing stuff on YouTube, it can be a challenge because the quality, the, 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 the quality of um, playback on YouTube is not necessarily high fidelity either. So, either. so I think there, there's, a lot, there's a lot that goes into these um, A-B tests. And I think ultimately, um, if you have an opportunity, you, sh you should do your own test. I think that's the best way because it, it's, it's um, sound. Sound is um, subjective. I, I don't. I don't think sound. Um, obviously, sound does not sound the same to everybody, because um, sound is physical, and um, sound is a um, is a physical phenomenon that has to do with um, waves and how they hit our individual eardrums, right? So I think everybody has different physiology. Um, different spaces that we're operating in. All of these things can affect how we hear sound. So I don't think sound is necessarily objective. I think sound is very subjective. Um, but I think there's ways to kind of like um, neutralize or try to make things conform in a way where it, where sound translates to the uh, maximum amount of, of, of listening environments and ears for that matter. But there's no way to make sure that um, a sound is objectively heard the same way by every person. So um, that, that's just my, um, my thoughts and opinion. Um, let's see here. Um, David Scott says, unless you have the money to blow and want, feature, want to feature a vintage NPC on a YouTube video, do yourself a favor and stick with a newer generation NPC. I agree that that that's probably the case for a lot of people. Like a lot of people don't necessarily have a real good use for um, certain like older NPCs, especially if you plan on doing a lot of work. But I think it, it, everybody's different. So I, like I said, I won't broad stroke anything. I think um, it, it's it's good to like use older devices and learn the idiosyncrasies of it and kind of get different feedback because it it like. There's an element of it that, yes, these older devices are great, like for eye candy, and they help to like make a space look a little bit more, you know, marketable as a producer and more lively. But there's a psychological aspect of it where these different devices um, influence different thought and behavior. And I think we can't discount that because that, cr that creates different patterns and helps us to develop different skill sets ultimately. And I think that's an important thing. So I think for that reason, an uh, older NPC can be great because it can help you to establish different thought processes and approaches towards music because of the way that the um, device forces you or kind of restricts you to, to work and approach getting a result. So we can't discount that. I know for me, that's been a very critical aspect of my development as a music producer and sound designer for that matter, is the idea that different devices kind of influence different thoughts and lead you down different paths and that can ultimately better inform your decision making and how you, um, you implement sound and what tools you use to create different textures and whatnot. So, um, I don't discount that, but I agree that for like, especially for if you're just getting started or if I would say, listen, if you're a singer songwriter, the new NPCs give you a, a, a larger variety of workflow possibilities that um, probably are, are better suited for a larger audience. I think some of the older NPCs are, um, are tough to deal with today and, um, for me personally, I, I, I do find that um, being restricted to say like just loop recording can be um, a challenge as far as um, writing music because like, I'm, I'm not very heavily like a sample based producer myself. So like all the like sample chopping and stuff like that, I do that. Like I've, obviously you guys have heard production from me using samples and whatnot, but that's not like my, um, that's not my first inclination. So I think for me, like some of the loop based concepts that exist on like a, a old NPC especially can be limiting as far as like how um, I like to work on music, but there's ways to get, a, get around that as well. Like I, I, I don't, 
I often don't see a lot of people like on an NPC use it with the loop turned off, for example, especially like the old NPCs, but you can, you can literally turn the loop off and start to record and it'll record as long as you are, um, are playing. So that, that kind of stuff exists as well. But I think we don't talk about that a lot because what happens is we tend to kind of mimic uh, an established workflow that maybe some producer has pioneered or uh, made to be kind of like the popular or de facto standard way of leveraging the device. And it kind of becomes ingrained in the culture of using that device. So I think that that, that alone is, you know, a, a, a advantage and disadvantage at the same time. Um, let's see here. Uh, Teddy Bear, a source track says ears differ and ears change over time as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, David Scott says, plus finding parts for these vintage NPCs is becoming harder to come by. I just had this conversation with Mike from NPC stuff the other day. I agree. That's, that's, that's very true. Um, Mr. Random says, do you still use the 4,000? If you do, um, would you recommend, why would you recommend using it? And why do you still use it after um, the years? I mean, surely it must be gathering dust and doesn't function properly anymore. Um, man, my NPC works well. <laughs> my NPC still works. My 4,000 works. Am I using it? Um, all the time? No, I, I don't use it all the time. It's a creative tool, man. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not one to like establish a studio concept that relies on one specific device to be the creative um, centerpiece for everything that I'm doing. Each device has its own workflow and behaviors and they kind of um, allude to their own um, music production process. I don't always want to work like the MPC 4000. I think the MPC 4000 is great if, especially if you're in a heavily MIDI based environment where you want to be able to manipulate a whole bunch of MIDI devices from a single unit, the 4000 is one of the best MPCs ever made for that. Like off top, like just the, the ability to combine MIDI signals and to like um, create these different MIDI routings and, and all this stuff that you can do on the 4000. By far one of the best NPCs. And then when you combine that with the, um, the built-in rack sampler, rack style sampler that it, it has, it's a very powerful device. You can do a lot with it. Um, mine is um, on a shelf right now, just cause I'm not in that mode right now, but it's a tool. If I want to use it, I can go use it. And that, that's the thing. That's why I told y'all years ago, stop selling your, your, your machines. Keep your machines. If you can afford to keep it, keep it. Because you never know when you might get the inspiration to work in that way or think in that way, or you might have a creative idea that requires said tool. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my thought. Um, yeah, um, 4,000 is, is not going anywhere for me. I still recommend it, but um, it's because I know it and I, I know what it can do and I know how I, I would want to use it. But I have, I, have other, I have other rack sampler tools as well. Of course, the, um, of course, the machine functions kind of like a rack sampler. So I like to use that a lot. Um, of course, the, I, I have the Akai S3000 as well. So I have, I have a, a few different options for that. So 4,000 right now, I think 4,000 4, really um, is the go-to thing when I feel like working with um, a MIDI base setup where it's like, I got to trigger a whole bunch of different MIDI devices, which I do have MIDI devices, but I'm just not in that mode right now. Um, Civil Day says, help you sample and make beats differently. Exactly, exactly. Knock Square, what's going on with you, bro? Um, restrictions are dope. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, music, ran uh, music Random, I think on the last function, he said he's on the MK3 now. We're using it as a workstation. Yes, yes, yes. I did say that. That's exactly what I'm doing. Still doing that. Um, 
Teddy Bear source says, seems like people have multiple samplers these days to get their, get dirtier textures. Absolutely. I think that's part of it. But I, I think there's other other things, right? There's, you know, um, different samplers have different effects engines and things. We talked about that on the last function where, you know, there's definitely people that use the SP404 for the effects, not the sampler for the effects. So th there's a lot of different ways to leverage these samplers. They, you know, they have different qu tonal qualities. They have different effects engines. They have different, um, even the envelopes are different on different samples. There's a lot of a lot of different reasons why someone would choose a specific tool. If you, once you start to really know it, then you can start to make like really precise decisions on why you use a specific product. And I think that's important. So that's why I'm I'm not one to just discount a new uh, a tool because a new tool quote unquote replaces it. I don't believe that. Um Let's see. Shadow Works says still does everything I need plus some. If you're talking about the 4,000, I agree. I agree. Um, David Scott says I am site did an amazing in depth changing sample rates and manipulation with the live two, and it didn't sound clean. Okay, okay, that's that's good. Like I said, it it really like source source material matters, guys. So never forget that. The source material matters. If there's no analysis on the frequency or, or the, the spectrum of the source, then it's very hard to determine whether a down sample, what effect a down sampling is going to have, like what kind of truncation down sampling is going to have on the source, right? Because we start talking about something that has, you know, that was captured at say 48 or, um, you know, 88.1 or 96, when you, down sample it, there's gonna be some truncation that happens. There's gonna be some like, like you know, I'll say it like this. When you say, when you're at 24 and you go down to 16, there's truncation that happens, right? So all of this stuff matters. So we gotta consider like, what are we sampling? What's the source material? What's the frequency spectrum? Like what's, what, what's, the maximum amount of frequency spectrum that was captured in the original in the original recording and then we have to then compare that and say okay is the sampler that we're recording able to capture all of it because i think we don't do that often with these um these sampler challenges and i think that kind of skews the data like if you're going to sample a break it skews the data already um calvin Rodriguez says rubber pads, plastic pads, keyboard keys cause me to express different flavors just as working in different parts of the crib. I like variety. That's what's up. Several days. Um, that NPC 4000 definitely teaches you how to layer samples. Absolutely. CX the producer says as an NPC user says the 60 to 4000 was my favorite. And we use those NPCs with modules and keyboards made it up to them. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Um, 4,000 is highly slept on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 4,000 was the first NPC that wasn't a phrase-based sampler based on the Z4. Thank you. Now, this is the knowledge. This is, this is the real. I actually had a Z4 back in the day, too. I had a... Um, before I got my first 4000, I had a, um, a Z4 with my 2000 XL. You might see, um, actually, that like on one of my old um, videos of, um, what was it, the NPC, recommending NPCs or whatever. Um, I had this old setup on the, on the thumbnail, and in that old setup, I had an NPC 2000 XL, um, but I also had a Z4. So that was my first... Um, my, my, my first foray into that sampler and then I decided, you know what, I want the workflow of the 4000 because it kind of consolidated everything. So I love that. So that's why the 4000, the 4000 is not going anywhere. A, a great rack sampler, I think you can, you, you, you'll always be able to use a, a great rack or keyboard style sampler. They, they always will have some function because they all have different tonal qualities. You know, someone, if, if you guys get a chance, um, someone that does a great um, 
a demonstration of like a lot of different rack samplers, go to Junkie XL's channel. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to promote him or whatever, but go to Junkie XL's channel. He does a great rundown of like a whole bunch of different rack and keyboard samplers. And you can get to see and listen and hear the different tonal qualities and textures that you get out of these different samplers. So that's why it's like, it's, you, you definitely, um, you definitely want to explore at least and see what you can get out of it because it, it does matter especially when you're creating sounds or trying to texture and and create a sonic signature in your music um let's see david scott i appreciate you i appreciate you i appreciate everybody that's um joined in on this so far this has been this has been a great conversation i know we kind of um, we're not exactly on the, the, the topic earlier, but I think y'all can watch that, go back and kind of explore that a bit. And I'll, I'll, this won't be the last time I talk about like this peripheral thing. We've been talking about peripherals for, for a decade on this channel. So we, we, we're not going to stop talking about this, but I just wanted to kind of share where I'm at with this whole like two handed approach that I got going with the computer. Now, um, that was, that was kind of the the beginning of this, but we're getting into a lot of other great topics. So I appreciate the, the conversation. Um, let's see here. Um, CX says also the 4,000 lets you sample um, while the sequencer was playing and also import 24 bit samples and change the swing of the quantize in real time. Yes, preach. All, all of that is amazing stuff. All of that is amazing stuff. Um, Let's see here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, God Science says that's why I love Machine Studio. Machine Studio is, is still a dope, dope unit. Um, the only thing, the only thing that I don't like about the Machine Studio, honestly, and it's not, it's not going to be what you think. The what I don't like about the Machine Studio is that. I, I, I wish that the machine had deeper MIDI integration or implementation, I should say, because for a, a product that has three MIDI outs, I wish that that product had like a full MIDI implementation where you can send program change and after touch and all these other things that you, that I normally use when I'm rocking a MIDI setup. I, always was frustrated by that part of it. It's a great MIDI interface. So if I use it with like Logic or something else that has access to the full scope of MIDI, it worked great with that. I just was frustrated with the fact that for a device that had three, was it three or, I, I forget now, I have, it's been a while since, y'all y'all can correct me, but the, the fact that it had multiple MIDI outs, but did not have a, a full MIDI implementation was always frustrating for me. So that, that's the caveat. But ultimately, I, I did enjoy working on the, um, on the Machine Studio before the MK3 came out. M MK3 is a really, really great product for me. I think it, it consolidates a lot of the stuff and, um, you know, works very well. But, yeah. Um, Civil Day says EA Ski too. Yeah, that's my that's my big bro, EA Ski. Um, he definitely we we chop it up a lot and like share a lot of ideas and thoughts about like different samplers. We're always kind of kicking things back and forth. So you know he's he's definitely a good person to listen to. Um, he's he he invests and that's that's an important thing. He invests in his setup and he has the right to have his opinions on stuff because he invests in his, in his setup and he and he puts the stuff through his paces. So, um, yeah, um, that, that's definitely um, a good person to, to ask about different samplers and drum machines for that matter. CX says, oh my God, Junkie has used every sampler known to man. Yes, he has, bro. Um, yes, he has. And that's why I trust his opinion on it because he has so much... He has so many of them and he can do direct comparisons and he can, he can put a sample in and put it at the lowest octave and show you the difference of the interpolation on the same sample, um, on the lowest, at the lowest octave 
of playback and show you like, see how this got that texture and that one got that. When he did that video, I was like, yeah, of course, like it totally makes sense. And that's why you don't want to just get rid of stuff because um, they all sound different. Like it's easy to test it at like the, the sound, the oct the, the root note that you sampled at. It's easy to test it and play back and say, yeah, they kind of sound the same at this. But when you pitch something down, you know, 12 semitones and then you pitch something down 24 and then you pitch something down 36 semitones and you start to, to hear like, man, the, 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 the degradation and the interpolation of the sample is totally different on these different samplers that's where it starts to really make sense and it's like whoa like you can get some really interesting textures with that kind of stuff um let's see um shadow oh hold on god science says have you used wave lab pro 10. no i haven't um not nah, hit me school me what i have not used it though um should i be using it now I, I mean, I used WaveLab back in the day, but not, I haven't used WaveLab Pro 10. So, like, what's new? I, I, I'd love to know. Um, Shadow World LLC says, the dopest feature to me of the 4000 is the 90, 960 PPQN resolution for the sequencer. That is DAW-based resolution on a 2002 device. Absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, shop says, what does the 9, 960 PPQN affect in the MPC? It's the timing. It's the timing. Um, it's the resolution that, um, it's the resolution that the sequencer can capture when you input notes. So, um, you know how we talk about audio in terms of sample rate, right? 44 1,100 hertz or 44.1 kilohertz, right? That's a sampling rate. That means the amount of times that the device is taking a sample of the electric signal to convert that into audio. So it's, the, it's taking 44,100 samples per second of the incoming signal and converting that into digital like zeros and ones that represent the audio in the digital space. So when we talk about um, parts per quarter note, PPQN, that's what it's called. It's the amount of spaces per quarter note. So it's, it's a resolution. So like, when something says 960 parts or PPQN, it, that means there's 960 different slots that your note can go in in between each quarter note within the sequencer. So, you know, you, your, your sequencer counts beats or quarter notes. So you turn the metronome on, you get the four, four quarter note click, boom, boom, boom. Boom, you know what I'm saying? So between each quarter note or each click, there's 960 different spaces. Now the old NPCs only got 96 different spaces. So um, 96 different spaces that the note can fall in, like you can input a note into between on the quarter note. So that makes a big difference, especially when you're playing live music, right? I think, what people tend to really like about the old MPCs especially is that 96 PPQM because basically it makes stuff feel very rigid and it makes you get like a certain groove because things are locked in. Like even if you don't quantize, even if you don't quantize, that 96 PPQN is just gonna feel good. Like I, like I would say for certain types of grooves, that 96 PPQM no quantize is my favorite. 960 for like no quantized drums to me sometimes is is not the move because it's too it too it's too much resolution but 96 can be can feel very locked in even if you don't quantize and that's that's why I like that um, but when you're playing keys and other things that need to have a little bit more like nuance in terms of 
like um, expression and whatnot, then the 960, 960 is great. It's great because it gives you the ability to add these like, um, you know, nuance, you know, strokes and things that help to make things sound more human. Um, somebody asks, is 48, um, 48 PPQ and good? Um, is it better? I don't, I, I, I feel like 48 is, is, is too coarse. Um, I think 48 feels a bit too coarse. Um, I, I, I like um, 96 for certain things. Um, I like um, even doubling up. Like, so if you like double the, if you, if you double the speed or tempo of a, um, like a 96 PPQN um, device, then you get double, right? So um, you get 192, right? So then 192 can have its own feel too. But I think um, for no quantized drums for me, cause I, I like to do a lot of no quantized drums too, that 96 can be great. 96 can feel locked in but without feeling too rigid. And then even just um, the quantize um, features that you get out of, on a 96 are gonna be, a 96 um, PPQN device is gonna be different from what you can get from a 48 um, PPQN device. So I don't typically like 48, but um, it depends. It all, it all depends on what you're doing. They all can work. Um, let's see here. Civil Days, what's his page? Is it Junkie? Is yes, Junkie J U N K I E X L. Um, X as in X Ray, L as in Lima, right? So um, it's Junkie XL. Um, he's he's got a dope channel. Like if you're a gearhead, if you're in the film composing, watch his channel. Like you get a lot of gang from him. He's not a hip hop producer. He's, he was kind of like a, a electronic music producer for quite some time in the nineties. Did a lot of like, I think drum and bass and, and that kind of stuff. A lot of electronic music, but, um, yeah, he's got a great channel. He's a film composer. He does a lot of great stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with his team on other stuff. Um, he worked with me on, um, sounds.com. Uh, on a on a release on sounds.com years back. So um, yeah, uh, great guy. Um, but yeah, check his channel out when you get a chance. Um, Chato World LLC says, so when quantize is off, you get a super accurate performance on your sequence recordings. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, galvanizing techniques. What's going on with you, fam? What's going on? Um, Zach M says, if you want classic sound, 96, 16th quantize, 63% swing. Yes, the science, get, get to the science, right? So th these are values that people have kind of found to be a certain type of, you know, swing. Now, I won't say that that's like for every genre, that's, that's what, what you mentioned is very specific to a, a specific genre, right? So we know we have we have to qualify that by saying if you want to make, and I, I need you to qualify, like some examples of like the producers and songs that you know that use that kind of setting because that's a that's a specific setting for a specific genre. So just qualify it. But I, I agree, it's a um, it's definitely um, a classic setting. Um, Chato says, um, that's why I love 960 PPQN because you can really create your own feel. Yeah. Um, Civil Day says, I wonder if Kanye feels that Just Blaze was better with the virus and the MPC 4000. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I, I probably Kanye, you know, he did his thing with his, his 2000 and ASR and the ASR is a beast, you know, like the, the ASR is definitely no slouch when it comes to, um, keyboard style sampling. So I don't know. I mean, there's, there's stuff in the ASR that the 4,000 can't mess with. So, you know, I, I think 
for each person, they're going to have different requirements. I'm not sure that Kanye was using all the stuff that the fourth, uh, not the 4,000, that the um, ASR can do, but the fact that 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 uh, ASR has so many different unique features and functionality, I would say that there's probably some um, just give and take in terms of like what he was missing, not having a 4,000 and a, and a virus and all that kind of stuff. So ultimately they, they, they both went down to make a lot of classic music. So I don't think um, it stopped either one of them. It's not really about the tools at the end of the day. It's about the, the person using the tools. Obviously it's a cliche, but it's true. It's true. Um, man, I don't want to make this stream too long, y'all. Um, I'm really testing out this new setup. Please give me a thumbs up if you like the um, like today's stream. Um, I appreciate y'all. Um, because I have a new setup now, I can go live a lot more frequent. Um, it was always kind of a challenge for me to do it. Um, let me see. I just want to test. I want to want to test real quick just while y'all are on, just to make sure we can do this. Right, and I'm already slapping, slacking. Um, let's see here. I just want to test a couple things here. Um, so we're going, while I'm on real quick, since um, I'm on, I'm testing this new setup. Y'all let me know if y'all can hear the, the music and stuff, because we, we'll be able to do some other things with this new setup if, it, if it's all working correctly. Um, Let's see here. Boom. Um, let me know if y'all can see my screen. Um, just want to see if we can start playing music and stuff. If y'all can see my screen, let me know. I think you should be able to see my screen now. Um, yeah, we're going to play some music real quick um, j just as a test. So let me know if you can hear it. Let me know if the, the sound is too loud. Can y'all hear that all right? Let me know. All right, if y'all can hear that, cool, cool. If y'all can see the screen, y'all can hear it. We about to get it in, y'all. Like this new setup, I mess with. It, so I, I think I think it's gonna work. Cool, 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 cool. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all for confirming. I think we'll be able to get it in a lot more frequently because of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. I think that's that's how we're gonna be doing it, y'all. It's, it's gonna be um, it's 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 gonna be more frequent, man. So um, yeah. Until next time. First of all, I want to wish all of y'all a happy um, Thanksgiving. I want to wish y'all a happy holiday season. I, um, definitely. Um, Pray that all of you guys stay safe and stay blessed and have time to um, do the things that you want to do this holiday season. I know last year was was tough. Um, this year, uh, you know, things are looking on the up and up for a lot of reasons. And um, if you're if you've made it this far, um, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. So um, I want you all to stay blessed and. Um, you know, we're going to get it in. We're going we're gonna to keep doing this. I appreciate y'all um, jumping on this for a little bit to hang out. And uh, I, re I really appreciate the, um, the conversation. Uh, I think um, y'all are like one of the dopest audiences. Y'all are one of the dopest communities more. So I, I shouldn't say audience. Y'all are, we, we're all peers. I'm just, I'm just on the camera now. I go on other people's streams too. So I, I don't look at, I, I try not to look at you guys as an audience, but more of a community that um, I've talked to online for a long time. Um, some of you guys have known me from 
um, internet forums and all kind of other stuff. So I've been here, just it's just a different format. So I really appreciate y'all like continuing this community. And um, I mentioned to th this before, it's about 27 of y'all now. If y'all would like to get on like a Discord or some other type of platform to have a, um, you know, a, a, a bit more continuous conversation, let me know. Leave a comment or leave, leave, leave either a comment or leave something in the chat room. It, let me know if you are interested in something like that, like a Discord or a Telegram or something like that where we can continue the conversation. Um, I would be willing to start that up so that we can have conversations. Cause what I've, what I've noticed is like when you guys get in these chat rooms and we start talking, it's great. It's, it's, it's amazing. Like the conversation is great. And I think we got to have spaces where we can talk because I, I know that it's, it's difficult for us to talk in areas like, you know, IG especially is not a great place to have a conversation. Um, Twitter, I feel like a lot of you guys don't like talking on Twitter for whatever reason. I, I get it. Like it's, you know, cancel culture, all this kind of stuff. You might not want to say certain things. You may not feel like expressing yourself on Twitter. I get it. Um, let me know in the comments if you'd be down for a Discord or a Telegram or, um, you know, wh whatever, right? So let me know. Uh, I'd love to hear back from y'all. Um, but this, this, it ain't over. This, this is just the beginning for me. So I appreciate all the support as always. Make sure you like, you um, subscribe and, you know, until next time, I just want to wish y'all um, happy holidays again. Peace and God bless y'all.